Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Um, do you mind introducing yourself before we start? Yeah, so my name is Vincent. Um, I'm, of course, a Patreon. And I do, uh, I hope, <laughs> I'm not shamelessly plugging myself, but I do also run another YouTube channel. Um, primarily, I am a physicist, but I also tend to dabble in other conversational topics like philosophy, um, oh. specifically epistemology, which is why we're here talking about morality. Um, but it's great to be here. I've been a big fan of yours. Very uh, greatly respect the Atheist Republic and Secular Jihadist, so it's a great honor to be here. Oh, wow. Thank you. What's your channel called? What's your channel name? Amateur Gedunken Experiment. It's a bit of a long name, so amateur is self-explanatory. Gedunken Experiments is a GED um, uh, G E D A N K um, E N and then experiment. Okay, uh, send me a link so I could put it in the description. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Bit of a hard name. Um, yeah, no, uh, yeah, that's great actually. But but anyways, for anybody that is uh, listening, if uh, if you are a patron, uh, let it, please contact us because we want to have these kind of conversations with our patrons. So. Um, there, there's instructions on how to arrange these meetings with us on our Patreon page. But thank you, uh, thank you for um, you know setting this up. Um, I, I'm a really, I really want to do more of these because uh, these conversations. By the way, this is v very relaxed. Like it's not like one of those form anything formal, like a serious debate or discussion. We're just kind of like chilling and talking with each other. But you said you want to talk about morality. Yeah, I've noticed that this is becoming a topic that is increasingly uh, popular, I should say. So mm -hmm. Cosmic Skeptic, I think, was the first one who brought, uh, who, who made me interested in it. And then him and Stephen Woodford from Rationality Rules have been right. having debates back and forth about that. And then I've read Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape. And so the question as to whether or not you can definitively, definitively state that morality is objective is definitely something that I find very interesting because I think it changes, as Stephen Woodford said, it changes everything. Just as the realization that free will does not exist would change everything, at the very least the way that we view the judicial system, the way that we view other people's actions, I think also determining that morality is objective changes how we can definitively state that some things are wrong. And the reason I wanted to bring this up with you specifically is because there's a clear social cause that we have when it comes to tackling the problem of Islam, and the way that Muslims are treated in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. And for me, I've noticed that there tends to be three different sets of uh, people who view morality. So there's the moral realists or objectivists. So these are the likes of Sam Harris and Paul Bloom. And then you have moral subjectivists, which I would consider Alex O'Connor in that, in that realm. And then the third one is are the moral relativists, where they say that you can't really judge anybody from a different culture because that's the culture that they grew up with, and they don't really have a good metric, um, or, or at least we shouldn't be judging them by our metrics. And so uh, I guess first, um, I don't think I, I actually really know what your take on morality is, so I'm definitely interested to hear what you think about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the, uh, based on your, the way you categorize it, I'm in the objective camp. Ooh. Yeah, like a more realist. Yeah, but but there's but I think you have to add one more here. There's two types of objective. Okay, um, when people say morality is objective, um, objective after you define a goal, after you define what you mean by morality, then after that it's objective. But defining a goal is subjective, right? right? But once you define your goal, the best way to get to that goal. That's the objective part. There's another object, moral object, and uh, people that think morality is objective that think that morality is like somehow within the fabric of the freaking universe, like somewhere, right? It's, it's independent of, it, it predates humanity. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. there's good and evil written somewhere within the coding of the universe, right? Yeah. That object of morality is mostly religious. Um, and it doesn't make any sense, right? Without without anybody caring about well-being, you don't have good or evil, right? Like the universe, there's nothing good or evil without human beings caring about well-being, right? The object, the people like me or other people that believe in objective morality, we don't think there's 
the universe, ca- there's anything good or evil within the fabric of the universe. We think that if you define morality as the best ways to get achieve the highest amount of well-being, obviously there are some right answers on how to do that, and there are some wrong answers on how to get to get to that. But yeah, there is a subjective element at the beginning, right? Whereas, like, okay, well, why do we care about well-being? The fact that we care about well-being, that's a subjective thing, right? But given that we care about it, the answer on how to get to it, that's the objective part. Do you understand right. what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely label myself an objective uh, realist, I say. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've been convinced, I would say, 95 to 100%, well, I should say 100%, uh, 90 to 95% by Sam Harris's argument. But right. there are two things that, I think bring me the most pause and the one is the very obvious David Hume's is an odd distinction where you can't get an ought from an is. I think this is a bit of a um, more so of a tangential argument rather than one that is just laser focused on the idea of morality and, and, I'll, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a bit. But to what you said, for instance, that we can really only claim that morality is objective so long as we have clearly defined parameters of well-being or what it is that we're choosing, you know, relative to some point. I, I agree with that. So, and I view it very much in the same way that, um, you know, I, I mentioned I, I'm a I'm a physics uh, student. You know, in, in physics, like in general relativity, for instance, or special relativity, sorry, you can really only define, um, let's say, like an object's velocity with reference to something else. There's no, you know, official stated velocity that an object would have. And I view morality in the same way where we can absolutely make objective claims about morality, but it has to be in reference to something. It has to be in reference to well-being. And if we are talking about well-being, then it has to be in, in reference to what it is, of you know, the society's values at that, at that moment. Mm. And so, and as, as, I, as I mentioned, when it comes to the is and not distinction, I have a bit of a hot take on this one. Uh, but by the way, can you uh, for the art is can because I'm going to release this later. Do you mind going over that and why that before you take mention your take, why that creates a problem? And this is what Alex also says, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but can you explain that dilemma over there? Right. So David Hume said that there you you can't derive something that should be based on something that is. So if it's raining. You can make a statement such as, it is raining. But you can't jump from that statement to, because it is ra- raining, therefore I ought to have a raincoat. You can only say that with reference to the claim that you don't, that you don't want to get wet. But you can't intrinsically say that there's any reason why you ought to not be wet. You can only say, well, I just don't want to get wet. And he jumps this over, of course, to moral, moral judgments, moral values where we can say, I want to be good, I want to mm. increase the level of well-being in a society. But you can't say that you ought to want to increase the well-being of society. And you can't convince anybody else that they ought to do the same uh, for you know society as well. See, okay, so let me um, mention this in a different way before you go to your take on all of this. A lot of people get confused over... So... If I say this is a beautiful painting, right? That's a subjective claim, you know, sentence, right? Like, you know, that's a, obviously that's just for me, right? But if I say, Armin, the sentence, this is a beautiful painting is subjective, right? But this this other, the second one, if I say Ar- to Armin, this is a beautiful painting, do you agree that that's objective? Right. If I say this is a beautiful ar- a painting for Armin, that's a sub- objective statement. Do you agree? Yeah. Okay. So then it's an objective statement to say human beings care about well-being. Right. Mm-hmm. That's objective, right? So right. in that in that sense, the fact that we care about well-being, even that part becomes objective. Right? right. So, the, you know, so you could, you could so w- let, let's go look at the, uh, you know, the example that you give, like the, with the raincoat, right? So you say that 
we can't convince people that they should wear raincoats. But the thing is that there's an objective reality that most people don't want to get wet if they mm-hmm. are, if they if they go under rain. You know, like it's it just is. It's already is. You don't have to convince people. That's already part of objective reality. Yes, for each like whether we care about getting wet and under the rain or not, that's subjective. But it is also objective reality that most people don't want to get wet under the rain. Right. That, all right. So it's you know it's it's already an is. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't have to make it an art argument. What we're trying to, we don't even need to convince the, the part that people are like, oh, you can't convince people that they ought to. Well, we don't even have to worry about that, that, that step because we have already passed that. We have or people already don't want to get wet under rain, right? I don't need to do the convincing part. So people like, like, for example, a lot of people that, that believe in subjective morality says, well, why should we care about well being? Like, we don't need to worry about that step because we've already passed that. It's objective reality that people care about well-being. I don't need to convince anybody. Right. Right? Does, yeah. does that make sense? Absolutely. That's okay. what um, Rationality Rules was telling to Alex uh, O'Connor on the most recent podcast. Oh, really? Uh, okay. The Cosmic Skeptics podcast. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great one. And I, and I agree 100%. And I guess my hot take is very similar to that, but it has a bit of a Deepak Chopra wording to it, and I'm going to do my best <laughs> to not sound like him. Okay. Because I think the is and ought distinction is one that doesn't make any sense on the same level that asking what is the color of jealousy doesn't make any sense. Hmm. Because the idea of meaning itself, I think meaning itself exists as an abstract concept, but it exists as an abstract concept because it was evolutionarily beneficial for us to develop it. But it's not, as you said, meaning itself is not woven into the fabric of the universe there's no way to be able to quantify meaning because it's you know it's just an abstract concept and because of this to to make the claim that you can say you know why why should you care about increasing the well-being of society doesn't make any more sense to me than asking how you know what what does jealousy smell like because it's not something that exists it it, you know as as you said we do care about well-being that's what we've been evolutionarily programmed to want to care about. There is this sort of, own, you know, it's a linear relationship between the way that we act and the way that we expect other people to act. Mm-hmm. And even, and people often point to, well, you know, you can say, you can say this, that's all, all said and done. But at the end of the day, there are going to be people out there who just have completely different moral views that are, you know, just diametrically opposed to yours. But I always say, you can even point at like, you know, a, a jihadist who's blowing himself up at foreign embassies wanting to get the highest kill count. Even though he's doing this, and even though that is completely opposite of what I would expect from another human being to act in a civil society, okay. he's still doing so under the impression that in the future he will increase the well-being of the society. He thinks that this is going to create a better society in the future okay. using the same definition of well-being that I'm using. Because right. he's under the impression that Allah is expecting this of him. But, right. it, but if his religion is not true, if Islam is not true, then we can say he is objectively wrong mm. about how it is that he is getting there. Right. And, and, and I think that to me is pretty much just the crux of the situation here. Where, and Sam, in you know, it's his book, as it's called The Moral Landscape, he, thinks, he says, well, you know, sure, we can all have different ways of, of a getting to well-being, but at the end of the day, there are some peaks that we can say are, are held for objectively higher moral standards. Right. And so, yeah, I, I, I hope I was able to articulate my my heart, my hot take as, as well. Yeah, as actually, that. what you what you just said made made me think of another example. And let me know if this makes sense, right? But based on what you're saying, um, when you said like it doesn't even make sense, it's kind of like if we're me and you having a discussion discussion on how to increase um, the, you know, food production from this farm, okay? And me and you are coming up, like, what, what kind of soil to use, you know, what kind of watering system to use to get more, to be able to produce more food, right? 
And this is a very good discussion to have, right? How, what can we do, right? And maybe some of the discussion, like how could we damage the environment less while we get the most food? But then if somebody comes and says, but why should we want to eat food? Um, and I'm like, well, we just we just do. Like, that's part of humans just want to eat food, right? They need to eat food. They want to eat food. Um, and that's the reality. Like, no. If, if that person says you cannot objectively decide how to increase, maximize food production because you can't convince me that we should want food. That's how irrelevant I think that the subject of you know morality people are like like well we do okay uh, like what's the point of this discussion when you're saying why should we want to eat food I mean if you don't come if you can't come up with a good reason right now why should we want to eat food it doesn't make a fucking difference we still want to eat food that's just how it is now some people could come up with an explanation but even if they can't come up with an explanation it's objective reality that we do want that all right yeah. and if you can't come up with an answer for why we don't want to eat food that doesn't impact the fact that there's an objective answer to how we could maximize the food that we get out of this farm. And what often aggravates me too is that the standards that people are applying to morality, they don't apply to anything else. So you can say, you can make exactly. the same exact argument against uh, morality, sorry, against health that you are doing for morality. Right. So you can say, okay, yeah, sure, we have clearly defined parameters of what is and isn't healthy. Someone who is obese is not as healthy as someone who is not obese. Yeah, but you also. you can you can just as easily say there's no reason why you ought to be healthy. Well, that's not a question that we're concerned with because people in general want to be healthy. And if someone says that they don't want to be healthy, we we consider that either you know that to be either psychologically incoherent. There's something wrong with them. You know that's why we have a whole suicide prevention hotline going on. That, that I mean, it's just not a question, or it, it's not the level of scrutiny that you attach to. That you would attach to morality, and that sometimes aggravates me. There's just huge standards given to given to moral questions that isn't given to any other discipline like health. And I think that's probably the best, um, uh, like the the best kind of comparison that people often often do. And uh, you know, it's it's one that Sam Harris himself well, uh, brought with as well. Well, to be fair, um, if, so when it comes to morality, even the people that don't care about well being. All right. Even uh, people that don't have sympathetic, uh, sympathetic, sympathetic views, sorry, like, um, or psychopaths, right? Um, they still benefit from the fact that most of us are not like them, right? Like they're uh, even for their sake, it's good that we're winning. Like the fact that most people are naturally don't enjoy seeing other people suffer at least the majority it's in the bin it's in or at least get uncomfortable by seeing other people's misery and the fact that most people get enjoy seeing other people happy right that's part of our that's part of how our brain is hardwired and it made evolutionary sense for why it's like that right but even if you point at, oh, well, there are these people that are not, their brain is not wired like that, right? But the fact that we define morality based on um, well-being for everybody, based on, the, based on the fact that most of us at least prefer well-being increasing for the highest number of people, has benef benefits even the people that don't want that. Do you know what I mean? Like, if everybody was a psychopath, then psychopaths would be living in a world that they would not be <laughs> wanting to live in, right? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so it's it's good that we we are we get to define morality, and you know we yeah we it's like we uh, the the people that care about other people are in the majority, so we get to dictate. To psychopaths, that this is how we're going to define morality, and it serves the psychopath's best interest as well. So it's better for everybody. 
That's interesting. I've never heard of the argument that we're making the world a better place for psychopaths. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an interesting one. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that because a lot of people come to me and say, like, well, I say, well, well, every time I say, people say, why should we care? And my answer is like, it doesn't matter. We just, we def- I mean, there's an answer to that. It, it, uh, it's not like there's n- the fact of why we care. There's an evolutionary. You know, there's a biological answer to why we care, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it does ma- that answer matters for different reasons, for scientific reasons. But when it comes to the morality argument, the fact that we care is enough for 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 the purposes of this 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 discussion. Why do we care is irrelevant. We just do. But whenever we, I point that out, then somebody comes in and like, but some people don't. There are I could I could give you this example and that example. This psychopath, this person wants to come, you know, enjoy some people enjoy torturing other people. I like that still doesn't matter. Enough of us do. And you know, it's like if somebody comes and wants to def- redefine words, like we all know what a cat means, right? Mm-hmm. But if somebody wants to come and calls a certain T starts calling them cats, right? And wants to refer to cars as dogs, are you like if I say, well, this is how a car is defined, and you point to that guy, I'm like, who cares? All right? We, like, the society as large has decided that this is the best definition for morality, and this is the most useful definition. I don't give a shit that there's a random person over there that has defined words differently, right? Or has a different <laughs> agenda or a different goal. Like, right. we, we come up with words, most of us agree what the, what's the best definition, what's the most useful definition for it, and we just run with it. Like you, like you said, this level of scrutiny doesn't come up with any like with other words. The the, the semantic game that people play, they don't have, they don't play this with other, with other words, right? If I if I say like, hey, can you give me a bottle of water? They don't ask me to define water, all right? And they don't say like, well, this this like when I'm talking to people, they don't go like, well, don't before you use that word, do you understand that this word means something else to other people? We don't do this with other things. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I'm talking about uh, no. you. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's perfectly fine. I mean, I will say that it's a fun epistemological question to ask why it is that we view morality the way we do. I think it's fun. Yeah. But as I said before, I also think it's it's meaningless. Mm. And and I think that's okay. I think when it comes to people who argue between objective morality or subjective morality, they both agree on the fact that so if this is the way that we're defining morality then you know that then okay yes you can objectively state what what is what what will increase the well-being of a society right. and i think that to me is the most important one getting stuck in the weeds with semantics about what it you know how, how are we going to approach the is and not distinction right. how are we going to approach the whole why question of it i think that's just all fun and games but at the end of the day we both really ultimately agree uh, and i think that was the the main thing that Stephen Woodford and Alex O'Connor kind of came out from their conversation. Hmm. The the part that I'm also the, that I'm mainly worried about on a societal level are the moral relativists, those that say that you can't yeah. judge the actions of people in a different country because they grew up in a different setting from you. Yeah, but that's and a different level of cra- that's such a okay, th- but that's a very different level of crazy. I yeah, think. yeah. But there, and what's scary is that you would expect this to be a fringe minority, but it's not. No. <laughs> you have people like Russell Brand. Um, who argued with Sam Harris on this on his on his podcast? And if you go on Twitter, it wasn't Russell Brand that was just uh, criticized to no end. It, it was Sam Harris who received endless grief. Wow! And that's the scary thing about it, because if I remember correctly, Sam Harris was trying to ask him like, where, where would you rather have your your young daughter grow up? Would you rather have her grow up in the United States or you know in a country like Pakistan or Iran? And he said, oh, I just can't answer that question. And it's a scary thing, but yeah. a huge portion of the United States actually does the world yeah. of the world yeah. actually agrees with this, except an, it, except religious people, and that's why this is the argument that religious people say that this is why we need religion because these non-religious people are moral relativists. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but go on. Sorry, I interrupted you. Uh, yeah, and, and it's scary because it, it's incoherent because the people like. Russell Brand, for instance, who's making a claim that he can't judge the actions of another of another group of people. Right. Well, the problem now then arises that when those act when the actions of those group of people start interfering on your own personal life, 
right. then you won't be able to, uh, you know, using your own logic, you can't justify why you should retaliate or why you should try to preserve your own life because then you would have to be judging the actions of another group of people. Right. I mean, their position is self-contradictory because they're, sa- they're telling us that we should let everybody decide their own morality, right? Their own. And like, wait, we should? What do you mean we should? That, like, that just breaks that, that just destroys your own argument. Mm-hmm. Like, why should I? Like, well, given that you're a moral relativist, then my morality is that I have to, every, my moral standard is that everybody should live the way I want, right? Mm-hmm. So this is just going to cut to... Yeah, it's like, just a, <laughs> like, uh, like, like they, they tell us, like, who are you... They, they tell us, like, who are you to tell other people how to live their life? I'm like, well, you're just doing that right now to me. <laughs> like, yeah. like, well, my... Based on my moral standards, I should I should tell everybody to live this way then. Like, how are you going to... Like, you, you cannot criticize me based on my, your own standards. Yeah, like, it's like when religious people try to say, uh, you know, you can't reason your way into believing in God. It's not about reason. Well, right. you're using reason to reach that conclusion. Exactly. So it's just this this self defeating prophecy. Yeah, I mean, you said you said Sam Harris got a lot of pushback for for his position, right? So mm-hmm. people are telling him, like, uh, people were complaining about him, but they they are telling Sam Harris that he should let other people uh, ha- uh, live, you know, have their own moral standards, whatever that is. So then, why are you not? So why why are you complaining about Sam Harris's moral standards based on your own standards? Like I don't. That's why it's so self defeating. Because you, then you just just shut up about anything. You can't yeah. complain about anything. I mean, wouldn't they say the same thing about like? Okay, I know this is a this is okay. I'm gonna do it, Godwin. Right? Um, would they would they do this about? Um, somebody should have asked him about Nazi Germany then. That was that was how they just lived at that time in Nazi Germany. Would they say like, well, that's just how they like? Who are you to criticize the Nazis? Would they say that? I wonder. If, I, I wonder what would be his response to that. Like, I think I, they have one. The only standard that they have is they have, which is like, I, is to let other people. Okay, so this is, I'm going to put, I think I know what they would say, right? Say no, because we're against them because they're imposing their way of life on other people, right? So their only standard they have is like, you could have whatever moral moral standards that you want to have, as long as you don't tell other people what their moral standards should be, which is interesting because what, what made you decide that that's the only thing that you could tell everybody? Because you're now you have a moral standard, which is not other, tell other people ha- what moral standards to have, but that's apparently a global standard. Everything could be local standards, but that one standard that just don't tell other people what their moral standards should be, that's, that crosses borders and cultures and all ide- ideologies. That's their, mm-hmm. that's their red line, the moral relativists, right? Yeah. The moral, yeah. But but the interesting another problem with their position is that well then where do you where do you draw the line where do you cr- draw the borders where people would you know before behind that line can tell their people how to live but they can't tell people on the other side of the border how to live right are you talking about is is it the cult the cultural borders or is it just the borders that we've drawn for countries, then who who drew those borders, right? Um, so if if in Afghanistan, um, men tell women to you know that they should dress up a certain way, um, are you is that have they not crossed like are, is that not men imposing their views on women? Like you just the the way that you decide that some people shouldn't tell other people what their morals should be, like where that line is. Uh, drawn where these people are your people and the, those other those people are other people that line is just they haven't they don't define where that line is right because they, these people are supposed to be individualists so if that line is just only drawn around one person right but you don't have your people every person is just their own nation or their own you know its own tribe then I would be able to tell, then, you know, then 
than any country that has any dictatorial regime, then I should be able to go tell them that based on their own standards, that they're imposing their views on other people and they shouldn't, right? Because they're saying their red line is that don't impose your moral standards on other people. Well, like, well, then can I go if if their cultures that they that they are the men are imposing their views on women or this religious group is imposing their views on minority religious groups based on your standards can i now go tell them that they're fuck you know, they they shouldn't be doing that it's just not consistent you know what i mean no it and and again it it, it does worry me that there's a good portion of the american population that actually believes this or the global population right and many Many times you'll probably often see these people rising to power. And I've never actually looked at whether or not it's becoming more popular to be a moral relativist or more popular to be a moral realist. The people whom I listen to, such as uh, Paul Bloom, um, Sam Harris, whose name I endlessly stated, uh, these people, you know, I do notice that they are managing to convince a good number of people, mm. even people with whom... They disagree with such as Sean Carroll, who's a physicist at Caltech. He's a moral subjectivist, but he still ultimately does agree with them when it comes to defining well-being and how we can increase that. Right. And oh, and before I forget, I also did want to ask you this as well, because I, I remember like two years ago, you you had a um, conversation with someone and I forget her name, but it was about veganism. Oh, and yeah. Yeah, I was asking the question, well, OK, let's say, you know, we, we you and I both agree on objective morality, how we're defining it, so therefore we have the same, or you know, very similar moral guidelines there. So, how do you justify um, you know, not being a vegan? I, I don't know if you've changed your mind on this, but I remember when I was watching that um, live discussion, you were not a vegan at the time. Yeah. And so, I, not, I'd like to hear no. your thoughts on this. Yeah. Yes, don't know. Are, are you a I'd vegan? Like to hear your thoughts. I am not. Okay. Um, well, I mean, this is, um, okay, this is very easy, though. Um, and I still have not heard anybody with a good response to this. And I think most arguments against veganism are are really shitty. Like most people like you say, like, oh, why you shouldn't be veganism? I just love meat too much. Yeah. Well, I mean, people used to. I'll, love... I'll give you a I'll give you an argument that I think is really shitty that one of my good friends gave, and we did a podcast on veganism actually not too long ago. So. I'll try to do him justice and, and steal man his position, but um, yeah, go go ahead. Okay, people say like, well, I mean, people love slavery. We, people, you know, so many, it doesn't make it right, right? So, but the best, but my reason, the reason why I think vegan veganism cannot be justified uh, is that, in fact, not only it's not ju justified, it's actually dangerous to uh, to animal well being. Veganism is dangerous to animal well-being. Uh, the reason is so we're so more in my in my view, morality is to increase the well-being of the highest number of um, beings that could experience suffering and happiness. Right. So it doesn't limit to human beings. It also includes uh, animals and potentially future uh, artificial intel uh, intelligence, that, that conscious ones. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to animals, um, w you have to understand what. What do they care about? Right. Animals, most animals are not self-aware. Right. And when I say they're not self-aware, it means that they are. They don't know that they exist. Right. So, I, for example, a cat un, is not self-aware. A cat is conscious that it uh, understands that it that its food exists, it understands that its owner exists, it understands that another sexy cat exists that wants it wants to fuck. Right. It understands that its children exist and it wants to protect. But the cat doesn't like, understand that itself exists. It doesn't maybe understands that its tail exists, the paws exists, right? But it doesn't have an understanding of me. That me does not exist, mm -hmm. right? Uh, there, the num the number of animals that do understand do have some level of self awareness are, are very very few, right? And again, this has nothing to do with being smart. 
Okay, some animals are very smart, but not self-aware, right? So I think it's just humans are self-aware, elephants, chimpanzees, crows, dolphins, whales. I don't know what else, but I think that's about it. Maybe maybe I missed a, a one or two. Um, but if you're not self-aware, then you don't understand what death means. And you don't understand if you don't if you don't understand that you exist, then dying is not a tragedy. If I take something from you that you never even knew you had, I haven't taken anything from you. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. not I'm not increasing your misery. I'm not removing your well-being if I take something from you that you did not even understand it existed. So but I'm saying, for example, a cow appreciates not being in pain. Okay? A cow appreciates enjoying its food. But a cow does not appreciate being alive. So if I kill a cow in a humane way, then I really haven't done anything wrong to that cow. Okay? Not, o not only that, if we... C so this is why I think animal rights activism should should have been focused on the treatment on a, of animals rather than this constant obsession over not killing them, right? And given that the reality is that most people, I mean, this is not a judgmental situation, this is just reality, right? Most people will not give up meat, whether it makes moral sense or not, right? I think this obsession over not eating meat has pushed the society away from animal rights activism. This would have been a much, much more effective campaign if the entire focus on increasing the well-being of animal was focused on the horrible treatment of animals in um, slaughterhouses, for example, and the way they're raised. In fact, that would have been such a bigger campaign and it would have been a much easier sell. Like, it it's anti-big corporate right? Anti-mistreatment of animals. It's such, it would have been such an easier sell. But because animal rights activism has been so, is now being associated with something that people do not want to give up, which is meat, they, they, they have this knee-jerk reaction to it because they don't even want to hear, you know, they're just like, it's something I can't do, so I just forget about it, right? So even if you're not talking about veganism or giving up meat now just selling the idea of caring about the mistreatment of animal is something that people don't even listen to anymore because right. because they think like they're going to be guilty into they're going to somebody's going to try to make them feel guilty for being eating meat if that was if it wasn't plagued with giving up meat then so many people would have been back like we could have probably had this with people voting for politicians that would have said past laws people would have campaigned more mcdonald's or kfc about buying meat from i mean they already do that like they, some people are already pushing for that but i'm just saying the movement would have been so much stronger if that was where the focus was like to right. reduce pain rather than stop killing in fact i know some people would hate me saying this <laughs> i mean nobody can talk to the cows right so a lot of these you know, when vegans say, like, oh, you shouldn't kill the cows because we wouldn't kill humans. I'm like, okay, let's put, our, let's put ourselves in the positions of the cows, okay? If we were in the same situation, right? If they could speak. Because they just assume this is what they would have wanted if they were, if they were, if they were able to speak. They're like, oh, the cows, the chickens, they can't speak, so we're their voice, right? If you, if some... If you had the option, I'm going to ask you, okay? This might be a different answer for different people, but that's why we can't assume what the answer would have been. But if I give you the option of between A and B, and A would be never existing, okay? And B would be existing for a while, eating, fucking, drinking, sleeping for a while, and then you hit a certain age, and somebody cuts your head off in a humane way, no pain, and you become someone, someone's meal. Uh, someone will eat you. Uh, between A and B, which one would you choose? Well, I have no idea, actually. I'll choose B. 
Really? You choose B? Yeah. Between not experiencing I, anything? I, obviously. Because, well, but again, if they're not enjoying any of this experience, then no, no, no. does it really matter? Well, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Let, if the focus, if, if I could give you a life where you experience, enjoy some things in life, yeah, I understand that if you live that life, you wish maybe the, you would wish for a third option where you could get to live and not be, not that you have your head chop off, uh, chopped off. But if your only options were A and B and you get to, you lived in a, not a miserable life. Right, you enjoyed food a bit. You enjoyed sleeping. You enjoyed, you know, you had a decent, you know, not an amazing life, but an okay life. And then you you be killed in without any pain. Wouldn't you go for that second option? I suppose. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is that most of these animals would not even exist if it wasn't for the meat industry, right? So basically, if you took away the meat industry. It's not like these animals would be free and have great lives uh, and would not be murdered. These animals would not exist to begin with. Do Are we sure that that would be their, their preference? Like, are you sure? Are we really making that this, like, we are we really saying that they would, because you pre-murdered them by, ne by making them never exist. Right. Uh, <laughs> right? That's interesting. I mean, I, I probably hold identical views to you when it comes to evaluating the you know the sentience levels of, of animals because as you said you know dogs are no or dogs or you know low level animals are nowhere near as sentient as, as ours as we are and however i would say that my position is a lot more tentative than yours so even though i currently do eat meat i can conceive of a future in which i eventually do become vegan Mm -hmm. And this has to do a lot with the argument of the expanding circle, where as society progresses, we tend to kind of expand our moral circle and we, we have more and more beings um, in, that, in that circle. However, and again, I, as of right now, I agree with your position. And I would employ the same arguments that you just gave me against veganism. But the reason why I say mine is tentative is because I am not confident enough in the current research that we have on the conscious levels of animals. So, so we know that, for instance, that dogs are most likely not conscious because they fail the, the mirror test. They can't look at self themselves in a mirror. They're not self-aware. The self-aware, yeah. They, they, they can't look at themselves in a mirror right. and recognize that that's, that that's them. Mm. But now we have to also evaluate, you know, you know, how do you quantify how much they enjoy living their life? How do you, it, it's difficult. I'm not saying there's no answer. I think there's definitely an answer, but I'm not confident enough in the current research to be able to definitively state that that they don't enjoy their life as much, um, that they're not able to appreciate that the life they have anywhere near as much for me to be able to be okay with um, eating them, I guess. But I would say that overall, overall, um, mm. I, am, I do agree with what you're saying. And the arguments that you gave were very similar, if not identical, to the arguments that I gave my friend when we were having a debate on veganism. Right. Um, and as I said before, my, my friend's take is interesting, and I l absolutely love to hear your take on it. So he is a moral subjectivist, and he doesn't really care too much about increasing the overall well-being of society. He cares about increasing his own well-being or his own personal utility. And because it, because it makes him happier for people generally in the society to be happy, then therefore he will do whatever he can to try to increase that well-being. But his um, his desire to want to increase the well-being of a society is not based on, uh, it, it, it's based on increasing his own personal utility. And so he, the way he views his veganism is that his personal utility is more important to him than the utility of animals. So he recognizes that many animals are tortured, killed, and slaughtered, but because they're not human beings, he doesn't care enough about it for him to be able to justify it to stop eating meat because he likes meat. Mm. And, his argument, and his argument really is, yeah, I like meat too much to care about the animals. That's a very scary position to take. Um, I don't know. What, what, do you, what do you think of that one? All right. Before I go to that, I want to respond to the other thing you said. When you said, like, we don't, the research is not you know, we, our understanding of 
self-awareness could change. The thing is that everything we do could be based can only be based on the best information that we have, right? I mean, if we wanted to take actions based on what the, what science could change tomorrow, then we can't do anything. We can't eat any food. We can't drink anything, you know. We can't use our phones because what if tomorrow's science, the understanding of, I don't know, eating eggs, like eggs could be the worst possible thing to eat. I don't yeah, know, right? right? But, right. Yeah, it has to do with confidence level, though. Not, not, right. with the, not with the likelihood that, you know, that it could change in the, in the future. Right. Like, you know, um, it technically, our understanding of gravity could change 10 years down the line to the point where Newtonian uh, mechanics is, uh, and Einsteinian mechanics are completely obsolete. Right. But we have a high enough confidence level to not be concerned right. about that. I'm not. I, I don't think that the confidence level is high enough when it comes to understanding the neuroscience of animals. But the confidence level is this. This part of it is high that we know self awareness is a later part of the conscious game. Yes, right? I would agree. We know that we know there is a line somewhere, and that we know self awareness is a way more recent thing than anything else. Right? Mm -hmm. Like we can be like, we know that bacteria are not self aware. Okay, so. We just we just know that we we can say with a high level of confidence that the line is somewhere, okay. Now where that line is is fuzzy, right? That's what we're not, you know, very sure about. But we're also very confident that it's very late in the game, right? Like it's a yeah. very recent thing, um, and most animals, like we know, we can almost be sure that fish, for example, are not self-aware, right? But um, but yeah, th but what what you're re what you're raising doubt on is where exactly this fuzzy line is, and we can just be extra careful and even go maybe not eat cats and I don't know dogs. Or, I don't know, but wherever the fuzziness is, we could just stay away from that as well. And I didn't say that dogs don't enjoy their lives because dogs enjoy their lives, right? They just the fact that they're going to die one day is it doesn't depress them. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, when they're and a dog is fucking another dog, that that dog is enjoying his, his its life, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the thing is that if if a cow is fucking another cow and it's enjoying that moment, if you kill the meat industry, then you are then you were robbing that cow from... So the argument of their, them enjoying their lives is an argument for the meat industry. Yeah. Right? Because then they would have never gotten to enjoy their lives if there was no meat industry. The, the yeah. key has to be to get the meat industry to not mistreat them rather than for it to completely not, not, not exist because if then you have... If you, if you eliminate the meat industry, then you, pre, you committed mass genocide... <laughs> to, to millions of potential cows before they were even born. I know I've, a lot of vegans would hate this l line of thinking, but anyways. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but when, it, okay, so when when you say personally, like, so when you said your friend mentioned that I just care about my own well-being, but that's technically true with all of us, right? The fact that we care about, when we say we care about well-being, well, that's because we're being selfish, Right, it's something yeah. we care about. I, I think technically there's no such thing as a def, uh, as a genuinely um, selfless act. Right. I, I think yeah. So so I agree with him on that aspect. Right. It's the part that he says that you know he, he even if you were to be aware of the fact that animals are sentient and conscious. Right. Um, the fact that he care, he likes meat so much that overrides any concern that he would have. Right. I mean, that would be the same line of argument that you would make for, you know, racism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we're like, or any, because technically we're supposed to only care about 150 people, I think, right? Oh, in, the, our, in our, yeah, in our tribe. And, and everybody else is the other. And the, mm -hmm. Like, everybody else is the enemy and we shouldn't, you know, I mean, the, caring about the entire world population is not wired in our brain. Right, so we have sympathy. It's not. It's not perfect. It's supposed to just make you take care of your own tribe and your own people, and mostly your own family, your own kids and uh, wives and stuff like that. Right. So, um, I mean, technically that's true, right? 
the the thing is that we also we are also obsessed. The reason why we care, why we want to come up with moral a moral code that also covers animals, even though emotionally we might not care about them as much. I mean, forget animals. I emotionally care about my wife more than most people. Like not you could that circle. That, that circle, the closer it gets to you, you're going to care more. You care about your children more than you care about other people's children, right? Uh, you care about your family, maybe more about other people. And then then if it gets to other species, then you're going to make care about them less. Um, and some people say, like, oh, I care more about animals than people. We're talking about in general, right? In general, people care about, you know, you get the... People are sympathetic towards their own species more. Other animals are also like that, okay? Except dogs, for some reason. Dogs care about humans more than they care about other dogs. But we made them to be like that. Um, but, but the point is that, but we're also, but the reason why we are coming up with moral standards that is logically consistent is because that sense of logical consistency gives us a sense of, comfort and security, right? So we're coming up with moral standards that just is anti-pain and misery in general and pro-happiness in general, not because we care about everyone equally. I still recognize that I would care about my family more than other people. I recognize that emotionally. But a society that comes up with a, such a consistent logical rules gives that that logical consistency also satisfies us, right? Like when I come up with moral standard for a society, I'm not coming up with moral standard for my emotions, right? That, that my emotions, I cannot rewire my emotions, right? My emotions will always be biased. And I'm just like, okay, my emotions can remain biased, but I get satisfaction from the fact that the moral standards that we came up with that is running the society, I get satisfaction from knowing that, that there's a logical consistency in it. And that satisfaction itself is also selfish because it's giving me satisfaction that I live in such a advanced and morally consistent society. And I think for that reason, we want to go after... Uh, moral standards that takes that is anti all forms of misery, even if it's other species. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree with it. And but uh, and I think there's also some danger, though, in in the way that we go about anthropomorphizing um, animals, because we kind of expect them to hold very similar emotions to us. And I've often wondered, and I can't substantiate this claim any more than I can just state it, is that. Whether or not animals are just, you know, for instance, dogs, whether or not they're um, so emotionally attached to their or uh, owners, the reason why they cry so much, it, it, it's not so much as that they are genuinely feeling, um, you know, sadness in the same way that we are, but rather that this is just an evolutionarily response, um, not, 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 not so far off from the way that bacteria holds evolutionary responses. They don't have any emotions. But you can probe them and they'll react in a particular way. And there's no feelings associated with, with the reactions that they have to when you probe them. It's just an evolutionary response. And I often wonder how similar are those, whether or not those evolutionary responses are more similar or um, to the dogs or animals as evolutionary responses than they are um, to ours. Yeah. Because we've developed consciousness. I mean, we've developed a way to be able to um, rationalize or or react differently to these responses. And some psychologists and evolutionary biologists will say that be that's because it was evolutionarily beneficial for us to be able to develop this level of conscious, this level of sentience. Right. But these are things that we can't say that animals have. And so the, when animals react to certain situations, are they, are they reacting more in line with the way that bacteria or, um, you know, you know, or, uh, anything else around that level is reacting or are they more closely reacting to the way that humans react? And well, I mean, they're closer animals... to us, but they're still very far away. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is what why I have a problem with vegan vegans because they act like they, every single standard that we have, I mean, a lot of the standards that we have for humans sh for, should we also be 
apply to animals. That doesn't make. I mean, a cow, if that that went through a comfortable life, ate food, fucked some other cows, had some children, got to take care, got to see its children grow, and then it was cut in pieces and eaten. That cow had a life that would be considered. To to cow standards, a very good life, right? I don't think cows want more to life than anything other. Than, like cows don't go to their life, uh, through their life, and thinking what is what is my purpose in life? What you know, they don't. That's not something like why why are we here? How am I okay. contributing? Why no are we among cows? Yeah, like uh, like why are we? Why are these humans uh, telling like? You know why are they the masters? They don't. These are not things that they ponder about or makes them depressed or, you know, <laughs> did you know? So it's so. For example, like people say, well, what? Wait, but the point I'm trying to make. For example, one vegan come back to me is like, I mean, you're saying animals are not self-aware, so we should be able to kill them. But they say, well, human children are also not aware self-aware onto around age three right so should we should, should it be okay if we uh, chop up like babies and start eating babies why shouldn't we do that um well because we care about babies is that you know imagine the horror to the mom or to other people if you chop up, you know, if you kill babies, like you, the emotional distress that you're causing to your fellow humans is ex- so extreme. It, even if the baby does not understand that it exists, you're committing a crime to the rest of human beings because you, you're, you're, I mean, even when it comes to cows, for example, separating a mother cow from a, you know, even the cow, if the mother cow doesn't understand that she exists, she still understands that, that her babies exist. And when you separate the babies from the mother, we know that the mom gets depressed. And I think that shouldn't be allowed, right? Because you're co- causing misery to the mom, right? That is something that shouldn't be allowed, right? So mm-hmm. even if the cow does not know it exists because your action is com- causing harm and pain to her, it shouldn't be allowed, right? So then they say, then what about... What if we found a baby that nobody cares about? <laughs> <laughs> Can we like the, like a baby that was abandoned and there is no family? Should we should we eat that baby? I, this is atheists arguing about uh, eating babies. Very how very fitting, but oh, yeah. uh, but the point is that the human society as a whole will be traumatized. If we just start cutting up babies and eating, right? right? Like this is not so, this is something that causes horror and pain to all of us with this knowledge, right? If this is not something the reaction you would get from the cow society, right? Like you cannot explain to cows that hey, do you know that after your life is over, you're someone else's food, and they're eating you? Like this is not gonna this is not something that you could effectively go cause trauma. And misery among cows, you cannot even explain this to them. You cannot even cut, you cannot even explain the concept of death to them. So they're way beyond getting traumatized about about this experience that they're dying and being someone else's meal. Okay, if you treat them nicely, it doesn't matter if you're killing them because that level of trauma. There's no there's no cow newspaper telling everybody like, hey, they're killing and eating cows. This is a tragedy. Like th- you're not causing that emotional pain that you would do in a human society, right? Mm-hmm. So that's why you can't treat these the same way. Yeah, it's like the, um, the the sort of thought experiment that some people would would often come up with. Well, if you know, for defining morality is wanting to increase the well being, then technically, if you have one person who's dying on a surgery table who needs three particular organs, and then you have three completely healthy people in the lobby. Then technically, wouldn't you be? Inc- uh, oh, sorry, it's the other way around. Three people dying on the on the operating table. One perfectly healthy person who has all the organs that these three pe- people need. Why don't we just kill that one guy and save these three people, and increase the well being? Well, like, what what a horrifying society we would be living in if that right. was allowed. So, yes. Yeah. So so it's always, I mean, they're fun thought experiments, but 
and it's fun taking ideas to the extreme, but they're also, I think, very easily, uh, very easy to combat against. So there, I was arguing this with a vegan, and his response to this was, "Okay, but what if I could? What if we could get society to a place where killing cows would and not cause enough distress and misery among humans?" That they would be traumatized about it so much, like that's his goal, right? To add to do activism enough to, to for enough people to be traumatized by it. Um, then should we st- stop killing cows, right? And I there's two responses to that, right? First of all, most if you if you look at the marketing that animal rights activists and vegans do, they show you the the suffering of animals, right? And the the thing is that it's not really the killing part that is traumatizing them. It's their treatment that is traumatizing them, right? So it's not a fair argument to say, like, well, we shouldn't kill animals because it's, well, because it's traumatizing fellow human beings. So you care about people not suffering. Well, then stop killing animals because these vegans are tra- traumatized by it. Like, no, because if you look at their material, they're not showing if they're not showing you clean deaths. They're showing you suffering. So the death itself is not the issue. It's the suffering that's the issue. That one point. That's one point. But then, like, okay, what if I could get m- enough people to care about the actual death, the actual act of killing? If enough people are traumatized by that, then should we stop killing animals? Human beings, if enough human beings are traumatized by that. Then I would say, yes, we should, but look what you're doing. If you if you are successful to get enough human beings to be actually traumatized by the death itself, then we should stop, for the sake of our fellow human beings, we should stop killing cows, even if it's humane. But you have made the world a worse place because you have moved people from not being traumatized to being traumatized unnecessarily. So you are traumatizing people for no good reason. Why? That's you're making the world a worse place by doing that, right? So why would we do that to our society? Anyways, does does that make sense? No, yeah, it it, make, it makes perfect sense. I actually wasn't anticipating for us to agree on just about every topic. I was hoping that we'd oh, be able to. Shit. Go. Yeah, That's, yeah, <laughs> I probably uh, yeah, but um, but still, it, it it's fun because I I like the way that you put things into perspective very bluntly, and oh. I, I've been told to never ever mention uh, um, Muslim reform in front of you because <laughs> you just go off you, you'll go off on that. <laughs> Do you but, want um, to? <laughs> no, 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 I'm, no you, you you completely changed my mind on that one actually. Uh, oh, okay. um, I, I I used to agree with the idea that. That Majid Nawaz proposed, where it's much, you know, the road from um, the road from fundamentalist Muslims to atheism is much, much longer than the road from fundamental, fundamentalist Muslim to reformed Islam. But I very, I, I agreed with their stance, the ideological point that you gave, where we're basically just trying to sell uh, more bullshit people. Uh, sorry, we're, we're trying to basically replace bullshit that people believe with other bullshit that is just less harmful to us, right. which I do agree is a bit patronizing. But also, I, I do agree that it might be more pragmatic. I, I do actually think that the road to atheism is much shorter, given yeah, the or, information we currently or have. Or to doubt, at least. Or to doubt, at the very least. And I think that's... And especially if you come from a fundamentalist point of view. Yeah. I think it's much easier to convince someone who was a fundamentalist Christian or Muslim to become an atheist, I think. Because I think, for them... They have this expectation of the religion where it's this solid gold armor, but as soon as that has no chinks in it, but as soon as they see a chink in it, right? That's an, I think that's more than enough for them for it to be able to crumble the entire armor. And also whereas, because yeah, go ahead. No, and I was just going to say, whereas if you're you know a very liberal interpretator of the doctrine, you're just very easy. You can very easily just justify it and employ mental gymnastics to try to. Right, um, yeah. and and also because uh, the the so called moderate Muslims, they are mostly like average people. They're just like average non Muslims, and by that I mean most people don't really try to make come up with a philosophy of life, and they try to make their behavior consistent with their philosophy. Most people don't really think like that. Most people just go through life. Right, and they just do what they like. They don't think about the consistency of their actions with their worldview and stuff like that. And most Muslims are just like most people; they're like that, right? 
the reason why I think the, the, the doubt method works better with the fundamentalists is because they are it, they are like us in this in the sense that they want they care about their actions being consistent with their philosophy, right? So because a lot of reformers point to all these moderate Muslims that are are Muslim and are living lives that are not really based on Islam. Uh, as if they, as if it makes their point, but these people really don't think about these things that much. So you cannot get the same result by making people think about Islam and trying to have a consistent, um, consistent a life consistent to to the Islamic philosophy, right? Um, the the fundamentalists, because they are in our camp, not. Not because based on their standards, but based on the fact that they care about the truth and they want to make. Um, that's why our arguments w- resonates with them more because they see that there's some consistency in our lo- in in what we're saying. Mm-hmm. There's some appreciation, even if they don't agree with us. There, even though if they think we're being stupid, there's some understanding that. There's no hypocrisy here in what we're saying, right? When they listen to reformists and say, well, Islam says this. I mean, you're a fundamentalist Muslim. You've studied the Quran. You know it doesn't say that. And when a Muslim tried to convince you, like, well, we should care about th- these people because Islam says this, the fundamentalist Muslim is like, no, it doesn't. Like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, I know it does. I know it doesn't. Like, what the <laughs> hell? Are you, right? I know it doesn't. Like, what are you talking about? Like, the, the, they are baffled by moderate reformist Muslims. Like, they are looking at them like, what are these creatures? Like, like the, the fundamental, when I say fundamentalist, it's also the mainstream. Okay. The mainstream Islamic thinkers, they're like, what is this abomination? Like, they are. They are more anti this reformist stuff because they don't. They're like, what the fuck are you guys saying? This is not Islam. But when they look at us, even though they think we're completely wrong, they're not confused by you know. They're not. They're like at least we get at least they understand that we're not saying something that is not there, that is not true. They understand that yeah, okay, but the fundamentalist Muslim. We understand that this verse is this. Nobody's playing games with you. They understand that we're not playing. We're not trying to make words mean something else, right? So, yeah. like, okay, now at least we have people that we have some agreements with. Now let's see why they think this is wrong and we think this is right, right? Mm-hmm. When 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 people throw out reality out the window, the fundamentalists think like we can't even have a conversation with these people because they're denying what's written here in black and white. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what's funny is that I've actually, um, so I tend to be more critical of very, um, I guess, uh, liberal religious people, more so than, at, at least in, you know, academic conversations, I tend to be more critical of them, because I think that even though what the fundamentalist believes is a lot more dangerous, at least he's being intellectually honest with what the book says. And it's because of this, I, I took a, um, a religious studies class once, and I remember I was talking to my professor, and he said that for the... For for the longest time, he thought I was actually a pretty uh, devout Christian because huh. of the way that I would criticize liberal interpretations of the New Testament. Huh. And, I, and I thought that was interesting. I was like, oh, no, I'm, I'm, believe me, I'm far from a Christian. But it's just that I think that the way that liberals or, or a, a more liberal and more, you know, kind of heartwarming interpretation of the Bible or of any um, doctrine, it's a lot more intellectually dishonest because you're trying to impose what your moral values are on the doctrine rather than letting the doctrine give you your own personal moral values. And with a fundamentalist, you don't really have that problem. You right. can, as I, and I was, as I said before with my friend, you, you, you can have a jihad, you know, for instance, a, a jihadist arguing against someone who is very, uh, like a very liberal Muslim. Nine times out of ten, the jihadist is going to win the, that debate. Because he, right. he, he can be able to substantiate his claims with the doctrine much, much more easily than the other guy can. Right. And so I, I guess it's because of that view that I, I tend to come off as, as a religious guy. Right. And well, and also because you have a Jesus photo right behind you, picture right behind you. What, on the, oh, wait, can you the... see that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, grew up in a, I grew up in a Catholic family, so uh. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I should say I'm, tech, I'm in my um, 
uh, childhood room at this moment. So uh, hopefully next time I'll have a better venue. But no, because no, no, this is fine. Yeah, it's Mother's Day, so I had to come uh, home. Happy Mother's Day. For the weekend. Oh, uh, I'm not a mother. But no, to, <laughs> to well, to your, to my to mom your, that you wish her happy Mother's Day. No, yeah, yeah to your family. Yeah. But um, one, one thing I want to mention is that the, the, the fight between Islam and anti-Islam, you know, is is not between Muslims and non-Muslims. It's a fight within, within the individual, right? So, and as you mentioned, um, you know, when you, when you look at a lot of people that became, you know, not, they're not fundamentalists anymore. They used to be fundamental. They used to be radical. Let's use radical. That's a better word. And they're not radical anymore, but they're still Muslim. Okay. I, I, I haven't yet found an example of a person that they, they become de-radicalized because of something in Islam. It was, so far, every single example has been, it was something else, non-Islamic, that influenced them. And then they went back, looked for, then they went looking in Islam for something to uh, legitimize their new views. Right, so the source of, the source of the their change in opinion is from outside of Islam, not not from the Quran or the Hadiths, right? And the argument now, the argument people have here now is that well, if they have changed their minds and they're not radical, then why not give them the excuse that okay, Islam supports this, right? What's wrong with that? Well, because they've already decided that this is wrong. They're, if you don't find them that excuse, they're not going to go back. Okay? Th there's the two-step processes, right? The third step is like, okay, this is fucked up. I cannot support this. I like, but, but then they were like, but I want to keep my Islam. I want to go and look for, look at things maybe in a different way that accepts this new view that I have about the immorality of these, these actions, right? Mm -hmm. we do, the fact that they've already passed the step that they think this is not right is already enough. We don't owe them the comfort that this is also supported by Islam. In fact, it's our responsibility not to give them that comfort. They're not going to go back in supporting those horrible views even if we don't give them the comfort, they or their humanity has already won over Islam. Okay, With, if you don't give them that, the, the reason why it's important because we've already passed the uh, passed the um, you know the barrier of like the 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 indoctrination of Islam that makes you think you know the very unnatural waves of um, you know it the basic. Things that wouldn't have happened if if it wasn't because of some some religion, right? The the fact that you already broke through that, you're not going to go back if I don't give you the comfort. In fact, the reason why it's important for me not to give you the comfort that is supported by Islam is because that comfort is what keeps Islam alive. You know, that comfort, that you know, it's a defense mechanism for this is why Islam and Christianity and these religions last so long. These religions should have died like hundreds of years ago. But this, when societies, you know, advance and we have better moral standards, the fact that these religions try to adapt is not, it's, it's a defense mechanism that keeps barbaric standards alive today stuff that uh, standards that if if it wasn't for this very clever um defense mechanism would have would have died many years ago these these people that keep the label muslim or keep the, try to convince us that these standards that we just with that we have these advanced standards that we have only because of you know enlightenment era and other reasons you know more advanced way of thinking about how to run societies if, if if when they sell the idea that this was always backed by christianity or by islam it's an excuse for this meme to not die 
but the thing is that the 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 true the true nature of the meme is the same, and this is a, this is just a cover. This is just a way for us to say remain relevant. It doesn't have to remain relevant. People, uh, you know, even even if people are still calling themselves Muslim and Christian, within them, Islam is becoming less influential, and other sources of influence are becoming more influential. Right. So when we're fighting against Islam, that when we're fighting against Islam, it's not just a fight of making more Muslims leave Islam. It's also the fight of making Islam less part of you, even if you're still Muslim, because yeah. a Muslim is much more than just a Muslim. A Muslim is many, many things, just like every person is many th different things. If Islam, if we go from a society where Muslims, Islam used to be ten has ten person influence in every Muslim to a, to a society where Islam is one person of influence in every Muslim, even if they still call themselves Muslim, that's progress. That's defeating Islam within an individual rather than just a battle of making it making Muslims ex-Muslims. Do you know who Andy Ngo is? I think so. The uh, journalist? The, yes, yes, I do. Yeah, he has a podcast cleverly titled Things You Should Know. Yeah. And I think it was his first episode where he had a Muslim scholar on and she documents the sort of, sort of the, the main mentality that is currently... Uh, flooding the Muslim world in the Middle East, you know, and Southeast Asia around there. And she's very open and honest about the ramifications that a fundamentalist view of Islam has had on society. But she still considers herself a Muslim in the same way that Majid Nawaz would consider himself a Muslim. Mm. And I've always been fascinated by that view. And the sort of, as much as I, I admire her honesty, um, I've always been fascinated by this cognitive dissonance that liberal interpreters of the scripture tend to have. Because I remember when I, I used to have this um, professor, or he, he's um, he's a very devout Christian, and I, I remember I was asking him this work because he said that you know he thinks that contemporary values are, are brought forth by Christianity, not mm -hmm. the other way around. And I told him, well, you, well, what do you think of the idea of the fact that you could grab your average you know Californian Christian nowadays who is perfectly okay with gay marriage, who's perfectly okay with um, sex out of wedlock. You could, you could grab him, you could take him back 500 to 1,000 years, and he'd be tried as a heretic, and he'd probably be killed at the stake. Mm -hmm. Now, you, the only way that you can justify this is that for the first couple thousand years that Christianity existed, everybody was interpreting Scripture wrong, and mm -hmm. God washed with his arms folded. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you just so happen to have the correct interpretation of it. Right. Because even then, most Christians are still against gay marriage. In the United States, I forget what the number is. It's what, like fifty-two percent are still mm. not okay. I mean, fifty-six percent of people still think that um, that that evolution is not a thing. Right. Uh, and so, you know, that, I've always been surprised by that and astonished by that. It's like you you have to ignore the first, you know, two thousand ninety percent of of nineteen hundred really, years. Yeah, eighteen hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's insane. Yeah. And, and you know, and as someone as as educated as him. I still keep in correspondence with him. He's a he's a great guy, a fantastic guy. Yeah. But it, but it's amazing to see how it, this is either something that he simply chooses not to recognize, right. or the amount of mental gymnastics that he employs is just honestly, I mean, it's, it's impressive. It's just amazing to believe in such the coincidence. You know, so for for eighteen hundred years, Christian nations did not have these values, and the fact that these values came about right after the Enlightenment era, which was a movement against organized religion. And these, the fact that these ideas became popular right after that, in, in, on such a scale, I understand that they were other people mentioned them before, but they became a lot more popular right after the Enlightenment era. Are they thinking it's just a coincidence? Like, the, the Christianity had these values all, all this time, and it just never showed itself? Until these people that were fighting against organized religion brought them, and then coincidentally, like I don't understand, like what is the? I mean, I've I've yet to see anybody explain this. Like, why did why is it that none of these Christian countries ever had any of these values until the people that were anti-Christian all of a sudden introduced them to the society? Right. The, I think that the argument that they have for why it's Christian and I will counter it right away, is that because the Enlightenment 
you know, era, the Enlightenment uh, thinkers were in Christian countries, right? So it must have something to do with Christianity. The reason why that's bullshit is because, well, the Enlightenment era could, if if it happened anywhere, then it should have been, would be because like then you could attribute it to that, right? Like, it, what if it it had to show up somewhere? Right. Mm -hmm. And anywhere it showed up, the people over there would have had a religion like, you know, it could not be it could not happen in a place where there is no religion. Obviously, like that doesn't make any sense because. What like, why is that not because so for the same reason, you could say, like, then maybe why? Why are you picking Christianity? Why are you not picking them being whites then? Right. Like, because it also happened in white countries. So are you going to say, well, it, 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 these values are white values then? If you're going to say it's Christian values, like, are yeah. you going to go that far? And also, another point is that, well, it didn't happen in other Christian countries, right? It didn't happen in uh, Philippines, right? It didn't start in Philippines. It didn't start in Mexico. It didn't start in Argentina, right? So... Again, if it if it has anything to do with Christianity, then why did it not start in other Christian countries? Um, and um, another point is that many other countries picked up these Enlightenment values without turning Christian. Like for example, when Enlightenment values reached Japan, it turned Japan into one of the world's major economic powers in the world, one of the most advanced countries in the world because of enlightenment values, and they never took Christianity, they just took enlightenment values. Yeah. Right? Um, and then there's another... And, and yeah. very quickly, um, I would also say that it's almost expected for enlightenment values to manifest, its, manifest itself in predominantly religious countries because enlightenment values tended to be a critique right. of what the current religious... Um, moral views were. So you'd expect it to manifest itself in religious countries more so than in secular countries. Yeah, and also, also, you know, in, in, in the Arab world, we almost had an enlightenment value, which was destroyed because of, because of people like Ghazali, but it almost happened. Um, it was crushed, unfortunately. Um, but, I mean, it, it could have happened in other places. It's more of a function of, you know, people having enough wealth and resources to start caring about philosophy and thinking. I mean, it happened, it, it, it also happened, it was happening during ancient Greek, right? Um, the, you know, uh, these, a lot of people almost came to a very similar understanding of best ways to run a society before Christianity was even a thing. Um which is more of a function of people having enough wealth and resources to be able to sit back and not fight each other and think about stuff, right? That is, that it's a function. It's more of a function of that than anything else, right? right. Um, and usually people come up like it was very, very interesting because you have such a huge uh, gap between people from different ages. But if you keep give them enough time and wealth and resources, they keep coming up with the same conclusion, right? That that these are the values that works. That works best that for, for uh, to increase the highest to increase happiness for the highest number of people, right? Uh, because it's objective again going back full circle because it's objectively true. Objectively, <laughs> objectively, these standards increases well-being for the highest number of people, right? I agree. Yeah, that's yeah, that's interesting. Hopefully, I'd be able to actually have a conversation with. Um, so I. Um, I'm going to share another shameless plug. Oh, I this is what I, wait, before you say it, this is what I was going to ask. Because if they say that because these values came from majority Christian countries, therefore they're Christian, mm -hmm. then they should also say Nazism is a Christian value. Yeah. And communism, which came out of Germany, is also a Christian value. Right? You know, Marx was German. Right? So if, you're, if your standards for what's Christian is only well it came out of christian countries then congratulations you played yourself nazism is now a christian value right and this is the same exact <laughs> argument that ben shapiro gives but it's a ridiculous argument because i mean christian missionaries i, I, I don't if i remember correctly you, you could say something like okay most christians um use their own personal money to sort of support bridge building 
Well, therefore, bridge building is a Christian value. It's just you, you can apply this logic to just about anything, right. but it doesn't make it, <laughs> right. it, it, it which is, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> right. Um, but uh, yeah. And anyways, I was saying, um, I've I've always wanted to 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 see how these people would rate because I help run the um, Secular Student Alliance at my university. And mm. interestingly enough, the majority of the people in our in our group are actually religious people. Mm. They're usually like Jordan Peterson fans that try to just debate us. And I've always, I'm hoping that actually I could try to get a straight answer out of this. Because to me, it's just blatantly obvious that our values don't come from Christianity, but rather that we project our values onto Christianity. I mean, that to me has just been self-evident this whole time. Right. I, I mean, it, there's. I think there's no other way to explain why our views on Christianity are so are changing so dramatically as the as the years go by. Because the moral zeitgeist changes, and so therefore we have to re reevaluate the text that we hold sacred. And now, yeah, and, and so, but so so I I, I want to bring up the point that you that you brought up now to them and see right. what they would have to react with. The problem with uh, Christianity and Islam unlike many other ideologies with regards to changing them completely based on new standards, is that they are hooked to a book that doesn't change, right? So, I, I mean, as long as they are connected, to, as long as Islam has anything to do with the Quran, Islam is not worth defending, right? Because people are like, well, oh, things change, um, ideas change, people's views of things change, change could be good for the better. Like, unless you could, I mean, if you could cut down the connection between Islam and the Quran, then it's, is it really Islam? Like, but as long as it's still connected to the Quran in any way, then you're talking about an ideology that has a book that endorses slavery, endorses wife beating endorses torture of um, people that don't believe in the book, which is very meta, um, and also um, endorses taking women in war as sex slaves, right? I mean, that's th this, we wouldn't be arguing, again, you talked about double standards, we wouldn't be talking about reforming this whole argument about reform we wouldn't be doing that. This about any other idea that endorsed these kind of that had text, even slightly suggesting any of these things. Mm -hmm. Any other book that even dog whistled any of these values, and we were talking about let's not throw out the baby out with the bathwater. Let's try to reform it. People were like, "Are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> like, have you read this?" book are you fucking serious it's only with this when something gets the stamp of religion do we play these gymnastic games like hey let's reform it let's not throw it away like yeah anyways yeah it's interesting i would expect the most comeback uh usually when i criticize religion or when i see people criticizing religion i usually only expect very combative people from the right because they tend to be associated with you know conservative christianity yeah. but recently i've been seeing a lot of um, attack towards atheists from the left, especially towards thinkers yeah. like Steven Pinker. And and it's weird because I remember um, Steven Pinker, for instance, recently called out the guy who's from uh, Al, Al Jazeera, I think, about um, associating the new atheist movement with an increase oh, in yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and, and he tweeted, tweeted it out, like um, calling him out. And you have, I, I think his tweet got like 1.3 thousand likes. And, and I would expect like, okay, yes, it, to me, at least, it seems like such a ridiculous statement to say that an increase in, or, or at least the new atheist movement is somehow um, deeply rooted in an increase in white supremacy. And yet you had people bombasting him, this guy with 500 likes, mm -hmm. who was just showing screenshots of Sam Harris, uh, Sam Harris's like headlines on torture and his views on race and IQ, or at least the recent conversations that he's been having on it. And I'm like, and even when Steven Pinker came over to my university, there were people outside the venue handing out little pamphlets equating Steven Pinker with <laughs> doing the same exact thing that um, the Latter Day Saint uh, movements, for instance, were doing. And they were, he was he they called them, you know, the Latter Day Atheists, for instance, trying to evangelize um, evangelize people into atheism. And these are and the university I go to is 
pretty damn liberal, so I couldn't imagine these people from, you know, college Republicans or Turning Point USA. Yeah. So that that was interesting. I, I'm something that I definitely wouldn't have expected, and yet it's increasing, at least on Twitter. I mean, I definitely I'm aware that Twitter is not representative of the general opinion, yeah. but it's a very loud minority fringe group. If we're and you know, so it's interesting. I, I, I it, not so much just um, you know, an argument I, as it is just a statement or an observation. Yeah. Um, one thing that gives me a little bit uh, hope with regards to this, the, this new movement from you know the regressive left and stuff. We keep calling it. I don't know. People say com- coming up with different names. I heard just recently somebody calling them the the cult of woke, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but we have gone through something very similar and. I mean, by we, I mean you. You're in the United States? Yes. Okay, I'm in Canada, right? Uh, if you think about the Red Scare, the Red Scare in the United States, um, I think that was very similar to what's happening right now when I come with the, with the regressive left. Um, because, you know, baseless accusations of people being communists. But... The, you, which is interesting. The reason why it's similar is because um, it's an overcorrection to a real threat, mm-hmm. right? There was a real threat. Russia, Soviet Union did have spies, right, in the United States, but and there needed to be a reaction to it. But the understanding was that the Soviet Union is going to take over any day now, and we have the enemy within. And that guy is a communist spy. This guy is a communist spy. You are a communist spy. And then every and then at some point, the people that were making accusations of who's a communist spy, all of a sudden start accusing each other, <laughs> which is very similar to the, uh, you know your uh, of being a communist. That was close to the ending. So now this the, it's giving me hope when you see the the leaders are accusing each other in the regressive left. Uh, accusing of each other of being white supremacists and Nazis, like, oh, this looks like the ending of it, because that was the ending of the Red Scare, right? When they started pointing at each other of who's a communist spy. And now, at that time, the whole United States really believed this, that, these, you know, there's a huge threat of, com- you know, communism is going to take over the United States. The- this is a major threat that we have to deal with. So these loud minority had convinced the population at large that this is a threat. This is a serious issue, right? Um, but the the, issue, the thing is that the smaller version of that threat did exist. But now that we look back, and now that we analyze history, we know that the Soviet Union was never at any position to be able to take over the United States. Like, it wasn't even close. Even though it was an enemy, it was a threat, it was not at all that big of a threat right so i think like when it comes to white supremacy right now for example it is a threat it is an issue it is an enemy but it's not at all close to the level of threats that they try to make it seem to be right but to make it bigger than it is they have to make everybody be a a potential enemy or an actual enemy right so just the same way they, they would accusing everybody of being a communist spy now everybody is a potential Nazi, or I recently was accused of being a diet Nazi, which is very interesting. A diet right? Nazi. I've diet heard Nazi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So That's apparently I'm... <laughs> so diet Nazis or Nazis or Nazi-ish, um, it just gets thrown around, right? But, but we, I mean, a lot of people that are not part, like anti the regressive left think that the whole... I want to make sure that given that they are overreacting to some legit problems... We should learn from that and not overreact to the movement that is the regressive left. Because I want to make sure, because they think the sky is falling because of white supremacy. We shouldn't copy them and think the sky is falling because of regressive leftists, right? I think it's, I'm hoping, I think this is a short term thing. I think they're going to do a lot of damage while they're around. Uh, They're going to their anti enlightenment movement. Uh, and they're going to make a lot of, you know, they have caused a lot of damage, but they're not going to last. And I think we're going to look back at them with, you know, and laugh at how ridiculous they were, just the same way we look back at the Red Scare and yeah, realize, hoping. yeah. I, I tend to be a pessimist 
um, though I do my best to try to, um, you know, I, I'm a follower, for instance, of Steven Pinker. Yeah, Enlightenment. Yeah. I was just about to mention that. So I try to I try to find solace in that book because um, yeah. I, I read that book. I think it's great, and I think he's right on just about most things that he that he claims. Yeah. And to me, it's very concerning when I see people because you, you have to immediately sort of psychoanalyze people based on what they're doing. So if someone brings up the questions, for instance, such as race and IQ, people are performing, or the regressive left, they're performing a psychoanalysis on that person and immediately assuming that he must be a white supremacist. Or if people bring up issues within the, you know, whether or not, oh, I, I don't know if I should bring this up because there was a big issue do it. about this. Do it. Are do you it. sure? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. So, uh, uh, for instance, Rationality Rules recently um, uh, oh. uploaded a video about um, trans women and athletes, yes. and the ACA immediately denounced them. And there had to be an implicit psychoanalysis that, not, you know, nothing Stephen said was transphobic. He was simply outlining his ideas on whether or not it was fair. But right. there had to be a psychoanalysis in order to come to the conclusion that he was transphobic, because nothing that he said was explicitly transphobic. You have to immediately assume he's bringing up the topic and he's not within the parameters of what we would consider to be allies to the LGBT community. Therefore, right. he must be transphobic. There's no way you can substantiate that claim. Right. And yeah, and I really like your, um, you know, uh, how you're equating this with the uh, the Red Scare. Because, yeah, that's, ac that's absolutely the same exact thing. Or at the very least, it's the same line of thinking. There are no right. good reasons to assume that he's transphobic any more than there were any good reasons to assume that people who... Um, you know, immediately somewhat uh, aimed a little more towards socialism, were communists, and they were going to try to right. um, overthrow the United States. I mean, you had people accusing people of being communists because they just went to a lecture just to see what the speaker was saying, and there's a picture of them just standing there, so like, <laughs> you know, yeah. so standing there and listening to a lecture, so like, oh, you're, you went to this lecture, you're a communist, you must be a communist. So it's so yeah. similar to what we're doing right now, you just went on that show, you must be one of them, right? You just <laughs> talked, to, there's a picture of you next to them, and you, sh you shook hand with that guy, your buddy, so you must be a Nazi. So it's so similar, and like, if you go look at the videos from that era, like, uh, their video, like you go on YouTube, like how to identify a communist, right? They give you six signs of like what kind of behavior could show if maybe somebody is a communist or not. So you could report them to the authorities, right? But like, I mean, that's that was even worse than what we had to deal with right now, right? Because at least right now, it's just like you're getting deplatformed. Um, you know, your YouTube channel is getting removed. And we're talking about in, in the United States... You had FBI showing up at your door. You go. You had to go to court because people were accusing you of being a communist because you five years ago you attended the lecture, right? So given that we survived that, I, I'm, 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 I think that it look, we're going to survive this as well. I mean, I'm not saying it's not going to cause a lot of harm in the mean. I mean, in the meantime, but I think we'll we'll survive it. You know who uh, David Pakman is? Yeah. Yeah, he, I think, I don't know if he still teaches at Boston University, but he did teach some classes over there. I think it had something to do with online media. But I remember he responded to a tweet that someone was basically saying that they would never vote for a white male. If I remember correctly, that, that would have been the tweet. And David Pakman, correctly, I would say, um, said like, hey, that's racist and that's sexist. Good. And then a few days later, he was informed that, that that lady called Boston University telling them to fire him because, um, you know, because... She thought that he was upholding white supremacy and all that jazz. Mm. And you, it, similar thing that happened when Steve Bannon tried to address, at, tried to perform an address at the Oxford Union not too long ago, where there were student protesters. Not just pro I think protesting is perfectly fine, and it's one of the great things about living in a free country. You have the absolute right to protest. But they were then trying to block people from entering the Oxford Union and believing that anybody who would actually attend this this address that Stephen Bannon was trying to give. Whether you like it or not, you are participating in white supremacy. Mm. And you had very similar views, uh, very similar attitudes when you had the Brett Weinstein incident at Evergreen State University. Mm. Which, fun fact, um, one of my housemates actually went to Evergreen State during that time. So it was fun to hear his, um, his story about what happened while he was there. And underlying every single one of these instances, there's this sort of base assumption that everybody is doing things... Um, for the wrong reasons, no matter right. what. Nobody is ever doing these things for genuine academic curiosity, as I mm. said, when it comes to the conversation among race and IQ. Um, they're, they're not doing it because they actually 
um, want to figure out the truth behind these matters. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. What matters is the worst possible interpretation of your actions, and that is either upholding white supremacy or, you know, w- wanting to hurt other people, doing things right. in bad intention, and that scares me. I mean, again, I'm a pessimist, but I try to find solace in Stephen Pinker's book. And Yeah, I mean, yeah. everybody has been a pessimist in history, given they looked, for everybody, it looked like they were living at the worst of time, and almost always they were living at the best of times, right? Um, and only maybe in World War II, people could argue, like, okay, we're we're living in the worst of times. <laughs> but, but almost everywhere else, was living at the best of times compared to people before them, uh, almost. Um, you know, one example I I have is like I I, w- I was telling I was telling people that I think gender is a spectrum, but I'm willing to change my mind if evidence shows otherwise. If I if I see I mean I'm not an expert right now. This is what I think, but if somebody convinced me that I'm wrong, I'll change my opinion if if there is scientific data. And they wouldn't have it. They were like, no, gender is a spectrum. They, if you say that you will change your mind, that means that you are a, you are a transphobic bigot. And like, dude, I'm on your fucking side right now as we're yeah. speaking. <laughs> uh, I, my position is your position. My, I'm just saying I might be wrong, which is true about fucking everything. And if data and science, if somebody shows me research that shows that I'm wrong about this, I'm just going to switch sides based on new available information to me. And like the fact that you're saying that, but they would, uh, they said that the fact that I'm saying that I would change my position makes me a transphobe, even though I, I, my position was the same as them. (laughs) <laughs> so, how, would, how would you respond to the people that say, okay, the regressive left, you know, all these people who are very oversensitive on campus, they want to uh, uh, block speech. Yes, they're all bad. They're all lunatics. But it's nowhere near as bad as the far right. It's nowhere near as what Trump is doing to this country. So why are you even wasting your time addressing the regressive left? Uh, how, how would you respond to that, to those people? Well, first, I've been hit with that. The problem that you have to deal with doesn't have to be the worst problem in the whole world for you to be worth talking about, first of all, right? Because if they want to make that claim, they're not like, well, then why are you talking about Trump? Because people are dying from starvation in Darfur, right? So shut the fuck up, go talk, go like, and then why are we talking about that? We should all be talking about global warming then. Oh, wait, no, we should all be talking about AI because that, that's the only thing that could end the human race, right? If potentially, you know, even if there's one person, even if there's a one tenth of a person chance, that's the only thing that could end us completely. So no talking about nothing else other than that, because that's the most important thing. So that's the fact, you know, that whole argument about this, there's other more important things. So let's talk about that. That's always nonsense, right? Yeah. To me, right? I always see those arguments in Stephen Pinker's comments where Stephen Pinker tries to make the case for centrism and people are always in the comments saying the far right is clearly much, much worse. Just like, just align yourself with the liberals already. Right. So, like, yeah. Well, I mean, okay, then well, let's go all the way then. Let's become, all of them become communists just to make sure that we are as far away as the uh, right as possible. All right. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting. Right. So, like, if if because because then I could tell them like, okay, so if you're not a communist, or like, um, let's see, I'm left, but I'm not a communist. So, like, wait, so given that the right is so bad, why are you not coming closer to me as a communist? Come closer to me, and like, no, I'm comfortable with my position. Like, no, so my position is not as bad as the uh, the the right is worse. So you should, if you go even a little bit closer to the right, then. You don't understand that they're the greatest threat, right? So given that you're the right, even though you're a regressive leftist, given that you're the right to me, that you you should be the platform and everything because you're 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 giving them legitimacy. I mean, their argument is self-contradictory. But another thing I would say to that is that the problem with the I mean, they keep saying Trump and alt-right as if that's the same thing. I mean, I don't like Trump uh, for many reasons, right? But I you know, people that accuse all Trump supporters of being alt right, that's just ridiculous, right? Um I mean what is the what is the threat of the alt right? Um oh, right, that, they say, or? Yeah, what would they say? Like what, what threats is the alt right causing right now? Probably I mean, um mm. Well, I mean, I probably wouldn't really say they pose much of a threat. I think the only reason why they are in the media all the time is because it's the people who are on the left that tend to amplify them so much. 
Well, but they make them more relevant. So, yeah. I mean, even if you're concerned about the alt-right, it has become the, not the left, the regressive left. Those are the people that are responsible for the comeback of Trump. They are the people that are responsible for making, I mean, it's okay signs are now Nazi symbols. The regressive left is like playing into their hand. Like they're become, they're, they're such a small minority, but becoming they're becoming more and more influential because their main advertisers are the regressive left, right? The regressive left are are giving them are making them more relevant and more influential than ever before because every small thing they do, whether it's a clown emoji or an OK symbol, all of a sudden has to shake the, our society to its very core. So even though they're nobodies and have no power, the regressive left just wants to give them all the power, right? So just they could just decide that tomorrow a football emoji is now the new Nazi symbol. And now they're gonna. The football symbol is gonna shake the fabric of this our society to very score. So they're like just a few people, but now you're giving them so much control and power. So it's also the pro, the fear of the alt right should be also the fear of the alt left because they are the people that are giving them all the power, right? And another thing uh, is that the the threat. I would agree that the alt right historically. If you look at a larger time, you know, t- uh, you, you, horizon, they are more damaging. Okay. Because again, I think this whole regressive, this cult of woke, woke I think it's, a, I'm hoping, it's, I think it's a short term thing. And I think it will die out uh, eventually, but the alt right will stay. Okay. The alt, uh, the alt, the, the anti Semitic views. From the alt right, the xenophobia, these these are views, these are ancient diseases, right? The the cult of woke disease is new, is you know, and I think it's a it's a it's a baby and it's going to die young, right? The monster that we're dealing with from the right is an is something much more powerful, much a much stronger meme, a much more ancient one. And much one that is not self-destructive, like the regressive left, and it will la- it will outlive most of us, right? Um, it's it, it, but the the thing is, but right now, if you just focus, if you narrow your view to now, I think that the regressive left is more dangerous, not as a whole. As a whole, the alt right is more dangerous. Or now they're called alt right. They're being they they go by they have historically they go by by many different names, right? Uh, but the reason why I think this whatever what we call the regressive left or whatever else we call it, the reason why that's more dangerous today is because they have control over our dialogue. I mean. On a global scale, I mean, the people keep mentioning Trump, and they're focusing on just one country or a couple of countries. But if you look at the philosophy of the regressive left, even though they're they're a small minority, loud minority, they that's the philosophy of Silicon Valley, right? Mm-hmm. And the the culture in Silicon Valley. The the stand the moral standards of Silicon Valley is what determines what goes into their community standards, and what goes into their community standards represents dialogue and what we are allowed to say on a global scale. Like look at what we're talking. Like me and you are talking right now on one of their platforms, right? Mm-hmm. More conversations are happening on the platforms created in a tiny city in California, right? Than more conversations globally are happening on that on the, on platforms from that city than conversation <coughs> than conversations offline or on any other platform. And given that their philosophy is ha- has such a huge impact on what we are allowed to say and express, I think they have a much much bigger impact than the alt right right now. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Uh, real quick, would you mind if I take a bathroom break? No, no. Well, the thing is, we're going to go up to two hours now, so we should probably end it here now. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. And um, I guess I'll, I'll close it off on saying um, one thing. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that you said, especially when when you you know take a look at Twitter. Even though Twitter is not representative of the general public opinion, 
the fact of the matter is, if enough people on Twitter complain, somebody can lose his job. That's what happened with James Gunn. Right. And, I mean, that that's scary. Because that, by definition, is just mob mentality. And, right. Yeah, I, mean, and, I mean, the reason why we came with free speech laws, the reason why the Enlightenment Value said free, free speech was a response to not to social media companies or private companies. It was a response to governments. And the reason why we came up with those laws was because government had too much influence over what we could, what we are allowed to say and what we were not allowed to say. And free speech laws does not cover social media private companies. But given that now these social media companies have a bigger influence on what we can say and not say on a global scale than governments, I think if free speech laws made sense at some point, and the response to the government's source of influence on our opinions and expression, then now it makes sense for us to have another law or some other form of reaction to the fact that these tech monopolies have so much of an influence over what, uh, over what we can express and what we can say. Yeah. Probably in a future conversation, it'd be really fun to talk about free speech as well. Yeah, okay. I'm surprised that we covered so many things. We covered morality, veganism, um, reform. Uh, I was trying to come up with a title, but there's so many things there. The regressive. That's what I was worried about. Yeah, <laughs> like three or three fourths of the way, and I was like, "Oh shit, what's he gonna call this video?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's yeah. just... But it was absolutely awesome talking to you, man. Yeah, no, I'm sorry it's if I talked to be too here. much. What? Oh, no, no. I, I said it's just an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. No, I appreciate that. But let me know if I didn't let you speak as much as you wanted. Did I do that? Oh, no, totally. Yeah. Oh, okay. I did? I didn't let you? No, I'm so sorry. You did let me. It's fine. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Sounds good. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, f- f- feel free to message me ever uh, again if you ever want to do this again. And also to anybody listening to this, um, our, our patrons, um, if you message me, I could arrange this with you as well. But yeah, this was fun. Maybe one day we could have like another group discussion with our with our patrons, like uh, oh. four or five people at the same time. That would be fun. That'd be fun. If you're ever in the, um, as I said, I um, I help run the uh, UCSB uh, Secular Student Alliance. So if you're ever in the Santa Barbara area, we'd love to have you on as a speaker. Well, okay, but the founder of the Secular Student Alliance thinks I'm a Nazi. Oh, no Nazi. shit, really? Yeah. Right, Ryan Bell? Yeah, yeah. he thinks oh, I'm... Didn't know that. Oh my god, he fucking hates my guts. <laughs> Holy shit, I had no idea. It's so funny. Yeah, no, no. He yeah, he has so you might get removed from Secular Student Alliance if you have me there as a speaker. Uh, let's maybe, do, let's try it, try it. Have me have, right. have me as a speaker at Secular Student Alliance and see let me know if your higher ups are good. <laughs> I get it. I'll, I'll see what I, him and um him and the president of the club actually have gotten into a huge argument on Facebook. Oh, interesting. About okay. Islam. So yeah. Yeah, but that guy, that guy is convinced that I'm all some like alt right, you know, racist bigot. I don't know, whatever. But he is, he he hates my guts, which is oh, so. It'll, it'll be a fun experiment then to see yeah. what happens. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Let's see what happens. Okay, okay. all right, take care. Right. Same bye. man. It was awesome. See you. All right, bye. Secular Jihadists is an increasingly influential podcast with much of its growing audience in Muslim majority countries advocating for atheists secularists, and enlightenment thinkers. We want to reach out to more people. If we reach 500 patrons, we will be able to translate our shows into Arabic, Urdu, Persian, Bengali, Malay, Turkish, and other languages in these countries. Help us get there at patreon.com slash sjme.